as the world warms and governments fail to find a consensus on how to limit the rising of temperatures, another potential path is starting to be forged. It's geoengineering, a process of controlling the elements, dimming the sun, sending aerosols into the atmosphere to tweak the Earth's atmosphere and to cool the planet, keep temperatures at levels humans can handle. But what could such schemes lead to and who would control them? Well, to get more insight on that and indeed the state of our world in general, we can speak now to the Director of Geoscience Department at the UNS in Paris and climatologist Fabio D'Andrea. Thanks so much for your time. Can I start by asking you, a lot of us are only starting to hear about them, but can you tell us a little bit more of what exactly is geoengineering? Well, actually, the word geoengineering en encompasses many different things. And the one you were mentioning, the solar radiation modification, is one of those. And it's one that is particularly worrying. You have to think that we will need some way to remove uh, gas, greenhouse gas from the atmosphere. And that is will be required because to meet the, the objective of, of the Paris Agreement. But what the solar radiation management wants to do is actually to spray aerosol in the stratosphere to limit the sun. And this is very, very, very worrying because we don't know the consequences that it would, we do, would have. And actually, we can also imagine bad consequences that that, that would have. Indeed, I have a memory of us trying to limit aerosols because it was damaging the ozone layer. Actually, uh, we were limiting some chemicals in the stratosphere to uh, to save the ozone layer, and that was a big success. Uh, aerosols, in this case, are little a little dust pow uh, powder, and uh, it has more of a radiative effect. It shades the sun, but the problem is that you have to keep doing it, and if you stop, the heat will come back again, and there will be a rebound effect. And then also there are effects that we don't control on. Uh, the pattern of precipitation, the pattern of drought, and also an effect on the photosynthesis of plants. And these are all things that we cannot play with. Now, the worrying thing is that there are actors out there that are also the public, state actors, but also private actors that have the financial power to do so. And so it's very worrying that some wackos could start doing these things. Because, yeah, a lot of it comes down to business and it sounds like it could be a radical short-term solution and a way of avoiding dealing with the what, what is trying to be achieved in the COP30? It would not be a, a solution. Actually, it would possibly reduce temperature. But, for example, it will not stop the acidification of the ocean that depends on the presence of CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's not even a good uh, solution. Not even a short time one. So where do you think, I mean, you mentioned there when people took on the CFCs, the chemicals in the aerosols, it was with dramatic success that the, the world rolled things backwards and improved our environment on that level. So where do you think we actually stand today at that, as that COP30 opens? Well, first of all, we have to think that since the Paris Agreement of 2015, we have made a step forward that was very, very successful. If before Paris, the world was going towards a heating of three to four degrees, and that would have been very, very bad in terms of impact on the society. Now, with, with the pledges that have been done by, this, by the different countries, we are heading towards a 2.6, 2.8 increase in global temperature. So we have done things, that's possible. And now in this COP, things have to be uh, more ambitious and the objective of the states must be even more ambitious. Uh, some countries have started doing uh, increasing their uh, their um, their pledged uh, objectives. For example, China. For example, the European Union. So it's actually possible. What I'm worried about is that the political climate has changed a lot, and you know it's no surprise. It's because of uh, what happened in uh, in Washington with the Donald Trump administration, and this change of of climate climate in policy or political climate can be very bad for once for the negotiation at the COP, but also for uh, the economic tissue, the investors, the person that have to put money in transition technologies, in transition of energy. This is very bad. That is what I'm worried about. But I think that the COPs are very important moments. 
I mean, when I, when you're not involved directly, you see a lot of pledges being made, but it's interesting to hear that they do translate into action, that we're already seeing a positive result, because it seems like a lot of talking, a lot of hot air, and not really progressing in the right direction. And as you say, in Washington now, we have a president who denies that climate change exists. Yeah, it is worrying. But don't forget that we have done things. Before the, uh, the COP15 in Paris, things were looking much more bleak, much bleaker than they are now. We have done some advances, so that is possible. And actually, there is an energy transition that is, is, is following its course. You know, uh, renewable energies are cheaper, they are taking over. So we just have to be the winner of this energetic transition and not the losers. Is that the main way forward? Is it switching from fossil fuels to uh, cleaner technology, which we are seeing China lead the field in? That is one of the way forwards. That is absolutely necessary, but it's not all that is can, that can be done and that has to be done. There is a transition in the production of energy. There is a transition towards more electrification of all the usages, but there is also an, a need for reduction of uh, consumption and reduction of uh, the consumption of energy in general. Um, so, you know, especially on transport and especially on the um, on, on the alimentary habits, mm. those things will have to uh, go down. I mean, they, they, they will need not to increase too much. So there needs While for energy, we, have, we do have a solution. Okay, so there needs to be personal responsibility. Governments, though, obviously need to take action and change their policies when it comes to climate change. But does all those actions not pale in comparison to the damage we're still doing with the wars that are being raged around the world? Look, uh, we... This world is wrecked by conflicts, by injustice, and climate is one that is adding itself to this scene that is already very uh, complicated and horrible. So that's how you have to see things. It's it, it, you know, the effect of climate will be of climate change will be seen through all these conflicts of injustice that are in the world. So we have to face them all altogether. But of course, this is a difficult task. Now, we're seeing this COP30 hosted in the Amazon, which was the lungs of the earth. It was, you know, something we relied on to absorb greenhouse gas emissions. That's no longer the case. It's now overall, I believe, an emitter of greenhouse gases. We're hearing uh, Lula propose a tropical forest forever fund. I remember hearing about carbon markets back in the COP15. I mean, how much of a solution do you think that is, turning our environment into something monetary? Actually, that was experimented in, um, with the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, I, I don't think, I mean, we have to ask economists about that. I don't think there was a very effective way to do to go forward. But for the, uh, the Amazon, it is still uh, removing CO2 from the atmosphere. It's just a little bit less effective because of the increase of temperature. And of course, what, what's going on in the Amazon is deforestation. That is the part that is emitting, actually, uh, greenhouse gases. So the, the struggle will be against deforestation and, uh, and the Amazon is still very important. Fabio De Andrea, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks so much uh, for coming on France 24 and bringing us your expertise on it all. Very much appreciated.